Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we come together, Father, to worship you, to seek your spirit, to seek your son's cleansing blood and his direction for us. Father, as we see the events that are taking place, each one must draw nearer to you and see what your plan is for us, how you will use us and where. Please be with us this day. May your Holy Spirit be here. May he teach and educate, Father, that we may be soldiers in your army and not rest until that day has come, Father, and that we may await your son, whether it be in the grave or whether alive, that he may return in the clouds to claim his people. Be with us this day, please. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's a big fuss going on. I, I wasn't aware of it until this week. <laughs> the writings in the New Testament of the apostles. I guess I should have been aware of it. I guess each one of us should have been aware of it because we were warned about this, weren't we? And the more you look and study at what these men wrote, what Christ's life was, the more you realize the personal responsibility we have to be a royal holy priesthood. Not to be led, but by one entity. Well, one corporation, that would be heaven. I say corporation because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But rather to be leaders here. And, you know, it's interesting how it's all put into a marriage setting. Because, you know, when there's a marriage, and this is the problem, folks, that there has to be sacrifice on both sides. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It does not work. Now, people may stay together, but as far as having a successful marriage, it's not. People may stay in abusive relationships, but the only reason it's a marriage is because there's a piece of paper that says so. And it's interesting that two of the writers of the New Testament, and all through the Old Testament, of course, but two of the writers of the New Testament compare or talk about marriage in a spiritual sense as it relates to salvation. And I find it interesting, too, that many people stumble over I chose you out of the world. Oh, well, that means it's predestination. Well, no. We were chosen because we were willing to be chosen. We were chosen, when I say we, the people who are going to be the saints, because they were willing to make that concession to have a successful marriage. Because how do you, what, what do you call it when one you choose your partner, correct? So even that terminology is correct. It doesn't mean predestination. It means you're compatible. And it's interesting, in the Old Testament, where did these guys get their wives from? Who chose them? God did. I mean, yes. Yes, the parents did. But... Who chose Abraham's wife? Who chose Eve? God gave these things went a little sideways now and then, but that's because of sin. So in these relationships, and, 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 and the New Testament also describes 
especially in the book of Revelation, bad relationships, abusive relationships. And that would be the one we're looking at. And that is, we were looking in Revelation 18 and compare it to, comparing it to what Peter talks about, the marriage relationship. And lo and behold, we see that com what comes into all this, the center point is the Holy Spirit. Because now we're talking about the latter rain, we're talking about the health message, we're talking about the third angel's message, which is the focal point, make no doubt about it. Mrs. White is very clear about that. And how this is all to be combined, and I find it very timely that this video comes along and tells us what we're dealing with. People get off on tangents and put this ahead of that, this, uh, and, and totally ignore inspiration. And this one says, and that one says, and this one says, but remember, there's a basis for it all. If they preach not according to the law and the testimony, what is it said? No now I'm going to tell you, in the health message, it is the exact same as where you get your information from. If they preach not according to the law and the testimony, there is no light in them. And I like the hot sauce people, because I hear it's an herb, it's this, it's that. However, oh, they didn't know about that back then. Did you ever hear that one? Well, that's interesting, because in the 1800s, there were many claiming to heal with these things. Mrs. White was full well aware of it. But then, the Holy Spirit doesn't know about these things. And when she writes not to use these things because they're detrimental to your health, and we make excuses for that, what are we doing? What are we doing? You see, you would come down on somebody who claims to be a Christian is using alcohol, right? But when she likens the use of it to alcohol, is it not the same? And what are we doing to counsel when we say she didn't know what she was talking about? Or skirt around it, yeah, but. What are we doing? The same as the person that says the fourth commandment is not what it means. There's no difference. There's no difference. Because who inspired it? Who inspired it? This is dangerous grounds, folks. Who inspired it? And then we, we build ourselves on these mountains and, no, I'm not accepting that. Well, then what happens with the light? There's a problem. So all these little things build into this marriage relationship. And then we start telling Jesus what he's going to accept when there's direct counsel saying, no, you don't do these things. What happens to that marriage relationship? See the problem? We all have these things that got to go. We can't make excuses for them. The biggest and the best one is culture now. See, I remember when they used to say America was a melting pot. We got to bring everybody here. What is a melting pot, folks? What is it? What is a melting pot? It comes out of a term that means you build a fire, you put everything in the fire, what does it come out? One thing. Now it's you don't insult anybody's culture. Well, how's that a melting pot? How's that a melting pot? Do you remember? You know what I'm talking about. How's that a melting pot? See the problem? It's division. Who works by dividing? Who gets order out of chaos? See, a melting pot levels that playing field. And these pots, you go in these iron factories, these steel factories, are so hot. How hot are they, Rodney? It'll burn your eyeballs out of your head if you're standing close enough without proper protection on it. Yeah, and the purest steel comes out of those. But we're liking to find gold. Now this, again, is a marriage arrangement. 
What goes in to make fine gold, Rodney? It goes into a pot. The heat. The hotter the fire, the more pure the gold. <laughs> Whatever the impurities are, they come to the surface and they're eliminated. Well, it's the same process in making steel. So this marriage has to be a pure marriage, and it has to be based on the gold. And then once we're married, are there duties? There are duties. Husband has his duty, the wife has his duty. Or it used to be. Now, well, that's, uh, you know, anti-woman. That's anti-woman, you see. And in all this, who suffers? You see, if this relationship, the husband and the wife have their duties, but if one refuses to do what they're supposed to, who suffers? The children. Always, without exception. Oh, I want to do this. No, I want to do that. Who suffers? And then the husband points at the wife, the wife points, no, it takes two, folks. There is no such thing as an innocent spouse in a divorce. I was married before, and people who are married and divorced and do nothing but talk about how bad their spouse is, be careful. Because then that person can't see their own reflection. Because I'm going to tell you something, before you got married, there were problems there. And it's interesting because, and I know people, I have somebody in my family that justifies their position. But I watched the situation, and there's no saints, you see. But in a marriage to Christ, he's perfect. He's perfect. And the Father will see to it that the bride is without spot and without wrinkle. And then there are jobs to perform. But there are also a way to do this. And if that marriage does not center itself around this, the children suffer. The church is not doing its job. The world is suffering for it. It's been here longer than it was supposed to be. The church has all kinds of excuses and reasons why they're not. So what does the church do? And when I say the church, I'm talking about God's people, independent or conference. They attack the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we don't even know who he is anymore. And I know I've been saying this. And in Revelation 16, that's where we left off last week. We see issues, folks. We see problems that this marriage is supposed to deal with and combat. And we're going to take a look at that and move forward. I will read these couple of verses again. And I think it's imperative that we understand what Mrs. White has to say about this stuff. If you look to the leadership of the church in this situation, you're lost. It's that simple. There's only one leader. If you look left or you look right, you have a problem. Who will the biggest enemies of God's people be in the end time? Somebody sitting in a pew next to you, maybe. Your own people. So there's only one that we can look at. And the only strong marriage is a strong union between a husband and a wife. It says here, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of, this is Revelation 16, 13, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the ba great battle, uh, the great day of God Almighty. Behold, 
I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So storms are brewing. Now we just saw elements of this battle, did we not? In the presentation before. Mrs. White says, and I read this last week, but I want to read over it and keep on because it's important to understand. Two great opposing powers are revealed in the last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commandments. On the other side stands the prince of darkness with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. Now, in our time, what would apost how would you define apostasy and rebellion, I wonder? How would you define that? Now, rebellion is what, according to the Bible? A rebellion? That's right. A leader of Israel, what was he told about rebellion? It was as the art of witchcraft. So we see a supernatural power driving the apostasy. What is apostasy? Apostasy is not doing the work that's put before us. Apostasy is changing things. Apostasy is not telling the truth. Apostasy is also an illicit relationship with the world. You see? And you'll notice that there are three mentioned here in Revelation 16. And it covers all the entities. The dragon, the beast, and who? You need to read Jeremiah 29. Important. Very important. Because you know what? Jeremiah names names. Jeremiah names names. He talks about what happened to Zedekiah. He talks about the false prophet that set himself up and what's going to happen to him. You see? What did Nebuchadnezzar do to Zedekiah and Ahab? What did he do to them? He burned them. He cooked them. Interesting. This is apostasy and rebellion, folks. No playing. And if you don't think that this church is not in captivity, you better think again. It's in captivity to men who change the most powerful evangelistic document ever published in the universe. The great controversy. That's right, Samuel. Who changed it? Personally, and I said this last week, the General Conference president oversaw the product to the point where my blood was boiling while I was in the back and Bill was writing, reading the letter from these dear people in Africa who thought that that book, The Great Hope, was what? The amazing book that will stand bright and shine through the universe as the greatest evangelistic tool that God, the Holy Spirit, has given to man. And that piece of trash that came right from the bowels of the beast, which is wrong, is being peddled. You better read. You better read. I, I recommend Seventh-day Adventists. I recommend those holding office read Jeremiah 29 because it's very pointed. And to say, yes, folks, I'm upset, and it's about time, that those who are spreading the three angels' message and the health message are Satan's workers, it's the same person who wrote that bogus great controversy. What agenda do you have? Would you call that apostasy and rebellion? Now, I'm saying this, all due respect to the high priest, 
But this has all happened in public. It's fair game. I'm aware of it. We have another gentleman who has come out and started speaking against the organization from Andrews University. Thank you. But while you were nice and comfortable, join the fight. You're very welcome. This is serious warfare. You see how serious the devil is, that he's taking life after life after life in the guise of a sheep. But the medical profession, and Mrs. White talks about medical doctors and nurses. They're important. We need them in a medical mission. She has quote after quote after quote about include them being in the medical missionary work. I have them. I probably, there's 20 quotes she makes. Consecrated, though, she says. Now, I tell you, this person we just saw, whether you know it or not, is consecrated. Because she's given up everything she's owned to, to bring this truth. What have you given up? What have I given up? You have not seen this whole video. You see? Nebuchadnezzar was consecrated. Darius was consecrated. Joseph, Moses, while they were Egyptians, were concentrated, consecrated. Well, you say, well, you know, uh, uh, Joseph really didn't have any problem. Well, you go into Egypt and live the way he did, and let's see how I come out. Let's see the decisions and choices I make. Because that was pretty amazing what he did. But I'm sure many were calling him Jesuit. Many were calling him a phony. Many were saying I have nothing to do with him. Hey, he went to Georgetown. <laughs> Where did Moses go, by the way? Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, West Point. <laughs> Where did he go? So be careful who you accuse. Yeah. Yeah. If they speak not according to the law and the testimony, there is no truth in them. It's that simple. I love that measuring stick. What is their stance on the seventh day Sabbath? Now, this woman may even not know about the seventh day Sabbath yet. <laughs> But she's finding a great, I believe, her and her husband, a great dependence on God. Because they've got to realize that's the only reason they're alive. Because, like I said, when you see the rest of that, you will understand why I just made that statement. Do I exaggerate, Yvonne? Because there's a supernatural power keeping her alive. By their fruits, you shall know. By their fruits, you shall know who they are. So, rebellion and apostasy... Remember, I read where God gave the church a letter of divorce in the Old Testament, remember? Because of rebellion and apostasy, or adultery, it's the same. It says here, the person that, uh, 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 Satan mustering his forces for the last battle. The, pr the, the present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. I think that's an understatement in our time. That's an understatement in our time. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the king's of the earth, of the whole world, to gather them under the banner to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Satan is to make more powerful efforts for the majesty in the last great conflict. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Folks, you know what? It doesn't matter what you have done the past of your life. It's what you're about to do. That's what's going to matter based on truth and the bedrock and the bedrock of God's government. Doesn't matter what sin you've committed. It's irrelevant. If we were judged by our sins, guess what? <laughs> Without that, guess what? The law, Paul says, condemns you to death. There is no life in the law. 
prior to the fall of Adam and Eve, they didn't even know there was a law because that's the way they lived. Without that, there's nothing. From grace to grace to grace, that's how we live. Your deeds. So there's no such thing as I've been too sinful. There's no such thing. It's what we're going to do from this moment on. That's what's important. And we like, as Adventists, to dwell in the past. I'm so tired of hearing about 1888. I really am. Yes, there was a problem. But I've got news for you. We have much bigger problems now than we did then. Much, much, much bigger problems than we did then. Mrs. White makes a statement, let the past stay in the past. Did you know that? But you know, too, and this is something that's never taken into consideration. When the church was founded, and for the camera, it wasn't Ellen White that founded the church or James White. They're not the ones that brought the Sabbath into the front, into view. By the way, how was the Sabbath brought onto the scene? How did that happen? By what medium was, what was used? Do you remember? Yeah, it was, it was Rachel Oaks and Joseph Bates and another fellow, I don't remember his name, but how did they do it, Rodney? The printed page. The literature evangelism. Bates sold his ship. He was a sea captain. And he took all the proceeds and they published pamphlets. And they went about distributing the pamphlets on the seventh day Sabbath after uh, Ms. Soates had a, 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 a discussion with her minister. I believe it was a Baptist. Most of them were. Why don't we keep the fourth commandment? What's wrong with that one? It wasn't by preaching. It wasn't by, well, I'm bringing it up, to electronics. It was pamphlets. And remember, last week I read all those texts that Mrs. White wrote about how the work would be completed. The printed page, pamphlets, literature. The Holy Spirit attends a person's mind when they're reading these things. If you don't have a relationship with your Bible, you cannot go to heaven. It is the owner's manual for the marriage relationship. How do you know what God expects if you don't have a Bible? A real Bible, not a so-called Bible. Why did I say that? <laughs> There's only one Bible on the planet that Rome acknowledges as a Protestant Bible. Which one's that? King James. King James. Oh, but that's hard to read. Well, that's intentional. Why did God make this Old English our Bible today when all the languages have been bastardized? You can't, I mean, words don't mean what they used to mean anymore. Even in the medical profession, you heard what that woman said, it's a new narrative. Because you've got to pay attention to this Bible. <laughs> Do you know that when King James translated it, it was so proper that even people of his day had trouble with it? Did you know that? And who in his day would have been reading it, by the way? Not the peasants. Who would have been reading it? The learned people. You've got to pay attention to it. You've got to figure out the wording, don't you? And these words, many of them have much more power. So there's a reason why it's left that way. You've got to study this Bible. You know, I do anyhow. I've got to pay attention to it. I actually like the Old English. But nonetheless, it does get a little er, 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 doesn't it? When you go through Romans 7, where Paul talks about the thing that I would do, I do not do, and the thing that I do do, I don't do. You've got to pay attention. All he's saying is the thing I want to do, I always end up messing up. But that's not what he says. It goes, zoo, 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 zoo. you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and in each part of the Bible, you're going to find these things. And to each one of us, it's, wait a minute, what did that just say? And then you've got to start digging and looking. And you start finding all kinds of treasures. Didn't Jesus say that the Bible was like a buried treasure? How do you find a buried treasure? Right. Do you find it on your first shot, you think? First, you go and inquire where it is. Then you want to find a way 
to it, maps and so on, but then when you get to where you, th you just keep digging until you hit it. Well, that's the way, to me, the King James is. And, and, and I thought it was funny when it was compared to that, and I said, that's exactly correct in my mind. When I read something that appears to be difficult in the King, I have to keep digging and looking, and I find all kinds of things. All kinds of things. It's, I think it's very ingenious, actually. Because the Bible that I find easy to read is not a Bible at all, is it? It's somebody's idea of what the Bible should be. And where did that come from? And where do we find that Bible? In what pews today? That's sad, folks. That's sad. So, she says here, Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Skepticism is prevailing everywhere. It almost seems like true Christianity has failed, doesn't it, when you look out at the world? You ever get depressed about that? The garbage. When I was a kid, the garbage. No, from when I was a kid. What they present, we don't even have cable or any of that stuff. I don't have any television. What they present for primetime television when I was a kid would have been X-rated. I kid you not. Do I exaggerate? The content, the sexual content, and the vulgar content of primetime television, America sits and laughs at. When I was a kid, if my mother thought I was thinking half of that, I would have been beaten black and blue. It's garbage. The amount of arrogance, children telling adults off. Really? To me, that's still repulsive. I can't, I can't deal with that. I don't know about you, but when I see a kid reaming out their parents, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, really? And then I think to myself, how would that child act in a classroom, I wonder? If to the mother and to the father, first of all, they're calling them by their first name in many cases. Second of all, at four or five years, they're hitting them. I would have had no limbs. Earlier than that, Earlier than that Rodney, yeah. They're telling them what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat, when they're going to go to bed. I mean, you know, how many times when I was in grade school, the sun was going down and I was watching it from my bed? How many times? At least five nights a week. Unless it was the winter time. But then I was up in the morning and my mother was down in the kitchen and guess what I could not do? Whether I wanted to or not. Guess what I could go out that door without eating. Now I see them at the bus stop with Hershey bars, Cokes, little kids. Fruit Loops, Count Chalky, coffee, coffee, yes. Samuel, yes, I go in in the morning to get diesel or whatever, and I see these little kids, and the mother's got a 24-ounce coffee cup, and the kid's filling it up, eight years old. And I'm thinking, I am glad I ain't going to be around that kid all day. And this is good. The sugar alone, because it's not just coffee, what is it? That uh, uh, lattes and stuff, lattes, do you know what's in them? You know what's in them? The corn syrup alone, high fructose corn syrup in there, the sugar, you could probably eat a box of Hershey bars and get less sugar. Put that in that little brain, and you've got it, you've, you, you've got C4. Yes, shuts down the immune system immediately, knocks out that immune system, and that kid is open to whatever the devil wants to do to him. Then the nervous system goes offline, which affects the brain. So now the kid's living, in my opinion, in an alternate reality. Then the cell phone comes out, and who knows, the pornography, that, that's what they're looking at. Because you know what? Brutality and pornography are the exact same emotion. So whether they're blowing each other up or Looking at pornography, it is the exact same emotion. And all this before they're what, 10? We're producing psycho killers by the thousands. 
How can the Holy Spirit affect that mind? So skepticism, I think, I am glad God's in charge because if I was, I'd have pressed the button a long time ago. But that's the difference, isn't it? And then, you know, when I went to school, the worst thing in the world, when I there was cardinal sin, getting a phone call or a letter sent home that I'm acting up. That wasn't corporal, that was capital punishment. And the biggest reason was because you embarrassed me, my mother would say. And she was right, because I did know better. And I cannot think of one instance when the teacher was wrong. I can think of many instances when I got away with it, but I can't think of one instance when the teacher was wrong. Not one. Not a single one. And of course, when I was in school, many times the situations didn't leave the classroom because I got whooped in the classroom. And I can't think of one instance when the teacher was wrong. Actually, I prefer to get it from the teacher. Trust me. <laughs> it was over and done with. There were no residual punishments around it. And if I acted up again, it went home. Then it was serious. I remember a couple times I intercepted a couple letters, thought I was smart until a couple weeks later, and my mother found out. I'm amazed I'm standing here over those situations. And rightly so. So this is gone. Now the child disciplines the parent, you see, as to how they should behave in regards to that. Because that child has rights. No, that child has no rights. How many rights do we have according to heaven? How much rights do we have? The right to the lake of fire. Without that. Without that. If we don't accept that, that's our right. So, in a marriage relationship, how many rights should the child have? By my grace, you will be here. But it's the other way around. See how the devil, skepticism? And this is carried into Adventism. It's sad. We sit here, we laugh, and I know, you know, many of us think back when we were children, the, Whoopings we got, and for what? And it's funny now, but you know what? That is why I'm here. If it hadn't been for that upbringing, I'd probably be dead. A couple times over. Due to stupid, dumb decisions. Things that were supposed to be fun, that went very sideways. Ever been in that situation? <laughs> I have a lot of my friends that are dead. So, she says here, skepticism is prevailing any, everywhere. Ungodliness abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. What does that remind you of, scripturally? Was there somebody tested in the scripture as if there was nobody else on planet Earth? As a matter of fact, an angel had to come and strengthen him. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When I read that statement, that's what I think about. I'm headed for the Garden of Gethsemane, and he wants me to sweat blood because that's the only way I'm going to get it. And it is physically possible. Now, whether that actually happens or not, I don't know to me. But it is physically possible. Animals can do that, actually, in stressful situations. Human beings can do that. But it is rare, and usually death is not far behind it. But I have to die daily, don't I? I have to come to that point of fear. And do you realize that the daily death is self-imposed? You realize that? How did Jesus go to the cross? Did any man force him to go to that cross? Could any man force him to go to that cross? What did Jesus say to Pilate? What did he say about that? He said, it's not by your hand. He said, if I, if I wanted to, I could call to my father and he'd send what? 
legions of angels to deliver me. So whose choice was it to go to that cross? Pilate's? The high priests? For this purpose, he said, have I come into the world? Why are we here? To die daily, to sweat blood daily because our sins are so grievous and to go to that cross daily. And you know what? I think when we do that, it's not hopeless. It's not skeptical because you know what? If one were going to accept it, what would Jesus do? You see? We're taught numbers are important, right? You know, it's funny, when you listen to old programs uh, back in the 30s and 40s, and, and these, you know, they would steal $5,000. That was like a mega amount of money. What is that today? That's not even half a car used. But back then, a $5,000 robbery was serious. It was a house. That's right, Rodney. You know, I was listening to a program yesterday, uh, 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 $3,200 uh, uh, Cadillac. Like, that's not the tires on a Cadillac today. But this was, the car was stolen. And they sold it for $2,200. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so the prices were different. Back then, now, today, what are the crimes? Billions. So we're thought to believe that if there's only one or two, it's nothing, right? But what does the Bible say about the presence of God? Where billions are gathered? Millions? Thousands? Hundreds? How far down did... Abraham bring Jesus when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also. And that's talking about a public meeting. Does that mean that he's not with one person? Of course he is. But this is a public meeting that he was referring to, wasn't it? So he works with the individual, it appears to me. Because this is an individual situation. Is marriage a group situation? Well, today you might think so. But is it individual? Is it between two? I wonder why he said where two or more are gathered. I wonder. Isn't that interesting? Where is your church? Where is it? In your living room. Where two or more are gathered. So then you could sit with your wife, husband, husband with your wife, and have a formal heavenly church service. Isn't that interesting? You can do it just one, two. But the point is, he was talking when he said that about a group meeting. But we're taught billions. Isn't that interesting, the difference? So Jesus says, one individual is worth the universe to me. Do you know that when he incarnated, Mrs. White says, and, and I have to reread all this, but you can go and look it up for yourself, into humankind, it, it costs him pain. Did you know that? Physical pain. Interesting, isn't it? Why did he do it? So I could subscribe to an apostate system and not do my due diligence to allow the Holy Spirit to lead me to be a royal holy priest, to go out there and spread the three angels in the health message? Is... No. He did it so that I can continue to sin and go to heaven. That's insane. That's insane. She says here, we need to study the pouring out of the seven vials. The power of evil will not yield up to the conflict without a struggle. So even in your own selves, folks, to get rid of our habits, to get rid of our sin, is there going to be a struggle? That's why a lot of people don't want to do it. They don't want, exactly, Samuel, they don't want to struggle. They want life microwave easy. 
But what goes along with that diet? Cancer, disease, AIDS. It's interesting how that lady put, all these diseases are AIDS. Did you catch that? They're all AIDS related. What is AIDS? Uh, well, you know what? If you'd have asked me before I watched that, I would have said some disease homosexuals get. But then lupus, I knew because I know people would look, is an immune disorder that I know, but they never called it AIDS. Alzheimer's, AIDS. Diabetes, AIDS. The body attacking itself. And I do know white people that have lupus. And when I first met somebody, I was like, what? This was in the 80s. It was very rare. I didn't even know that black people got it a lot. But then I just found out why. But white people have AIDS. And I knew a lady in New Jersey who actually had to give up a, 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 her job, everything, because of it, or had lupus. I didn't know what it was, and the way she described it, I didn't know it was lupus. At the now, I mean, after learning about it, I said, wow, she had lupus. I didn't know white people got it. But if it comes from what they're saying, there's a lot of white people that have it, and guess what? They're not calling it lupus, because that's not what she called it. Lupus is a horrible disease. Lupus is an absolutely horrible disease. It's, 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 hor and, and, and it's a horrible disease. And now we know where it comes from. But they're all AIDS. It's all attacking the immune system. And what is the immune system? The protection, the strength. But how do you transfer that into the spiritual? Would you attack the Holy Spirit? Is it not directly related? Isn't that interesting? In my mind it is. If it were very possible, the very elite would be diseased, uh, deceived. Isn't that interesting? Why are they not deceived? Because the Holy Spirit is protecting them. Their immune system to sin is intact. Remember what I read out of these papers this morning. The reason for the health message is because of the physical affecting the spiritual. The devil knows this. You have to be prepared to receive the kingdom of heaven. When did Jesus say the kingdom of heaven comes to us? What did he say to the man? Now. You follow me now. That's the kingdom of heaven. But of course, the translation she talks about, too. That's a different event. But you see, in my mind, you attack a spiritual immune system when you attack the Holy Spirit. Because by what other measure will we have to know whether something's right or wrong? Because again, without the Holy Spirit and his protection, the law does what to us? Kills us. If I don't understand that, which the understanding comes from whom? Now let me show you how that's a fact. At Christ's crucifixion, did the Christians understand what was going on? No. A Roman centurion did, to an extent. But did the Christian world at that time, the faithful Christians, did Christ's disciples, the soon-to-be apostles, understand what was going on. They're full of disease, spiritually. They were full of the Pharisees' vaccinations. Isn't that interesting? Does that fit or am I making it up? Look at traditions. Look at Paul when he was Saul. Kept going back to the wrong doctors, didn't he? And by the way, they were doctors too, but they weren't consecrated. So, after the upper room, did they understand? What was the difference? The Holy Spirit. They had AIDS. Their spiritual immune system was gone because they were vaccinated with tradition. 
Very good word. You see, the devil figured out how to get in there and mess them up. Well, folks, that's our job. That's our job. We're to go out there, not to be in confusion, not to be disappointed, because after all, is it my fight or is it God's fight? I choose to be married to the fight. But there's the key word, choose. Because right now, what is Jesus doing? He's fighting for who? For me. For my diseased condition. Because remember, sin is compared to what? Leprosy. Is it not? And that's amazing. What is leprosy? What is it? Immune system disorder. It's, it's crazy how simple it is. Isn't it? It's, it's insane. And only, only the Holy Spirit can fix it. Only. Or show us how. No doctor. No PhD. No conference president. No independent preacher. Only the Holy Spirit. Do you see why he's under attack? Do you see why? And it's sad that God's people know not where they're a bomb. Why? And those words that were spoken about the king, is there not a bomb? And what did that mean? Why are you going to these foreign doctors? Why are you going to these professors? Is there not truth in Israel? Can that not heal? So as I read these verses, and I read what, and I didn't get anywhere as near I wanted to get to today, but that's irrelevant. It's not up to me anyhow. I see how the health message has to be in here. Because if it's not, it's not a complete message. Because we have to be spiritually and physically what? Fit. Do, does God expect us to play a part in that? Because when I say, I can sin and go to heaven, I'm mentally deranged. The disease has taken its effect. The tumor has metastasized. The blood feeding it has come from Rome. From the beast. From the dragon. From the false prophet. And another amazing thing has taken place. What are most pharmaceuticals, well, not most, but many produce a false sense of what? Security. They treat symptoms. They do not treat the disease. Some of them are even hallucinogenic. What does it say? I shall send strong delusion upon them by their sorceries where the nations... But we have to agree to ingest those sorceries. See, it's all choice. A marriage relationship, there are responsibilities. And each part, each partner has to play their part. If one does not, it's done. And in our fallen state, it adversely affects the other one. And the situation is... Okay, well, let me go mess around with somebody else. Isn't that interesting? Because the marriage relationship between the Seventh-day Adventist church and, and I don't care, independent or not, if it is not built on that, because remember what Paul said when he went through all his philosophy? What did he say? I'll only preach, preach Christ and him crucified. That's the only way to make it. If it's not based on that, then you're a whoring after other gods, no matter how you look at it. So, folks, as we see this battle of Armageddon taking place, we are given the recipe for total and complete victory. Oh, the body may fall, but what did Jesus say? Don't fear him who can kill the body, but him who, simply put, can cast you into the lake of fire, which would be who? God. 
Be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You know how I translate that? Keep the Sabbath the way Jesus did. That's how I translate that verse. Because if we do what Jesus did on the Sabbath, what problems will we have? Because that was his biggest problem, wasn't it? With the Pharisees. So we're going to stop there. Let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you, Father, for, again, the simplicity of your word. Father, each and every person here, we all have our ideas. We all have the way things should be done. We all think different thoughts. However, there must be one main thought, and that is how best to serve you. But each of us brings something different to the table, and you have a use for each one of us. May we search and find out what that is and fulfill that, Father, that there may be more in your kingdom. Help us to trust no man. Help us to follow no man, Father, but rather the Lamb, wheresoever he goes. We praise you and we thank you for this Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.